Morning, folks. I'm Dave Canterbury with Self Reliance Outfitters and the Pathfinder School down here at the Pathfinder Outdoor Classroom. I just finished a winter skills class this very morning. Just got the students out of here. Shelters broke down, things taken care of, classroom area cleaned up. And I wanted to get this video out to you today. Now, the video may seem a little bit timely to you. However, it's been in the making for about three weeks in my head. And I've made lots of posts in the Pathfinder Learning Center, referenced the research, referenced some of the things that I've been concluding from my studies about this subject. So what we're going to talk about today is the science and physics of campfires. I'm going to give you the real science and the real terminology and the facts of the way it really works so that you understand how to manipulate campfire heat to take the best advantage of it in a wintertime situation. And that is exactly what we dwelled on heavy in this winter skills class. We spent the first night at this winter skills class in a traditional style bedroll with no fires so that they understood what it took to build a system of something to sleep on, in, and under that would protect you from those exterior elements and trap enough body heat to keep you warm and battle the conduction from the ground in a wintertime environment at temperatures below freezing. The second night, we actually went through a large exercise during the day, building several survival style shelters built to manipulate heat in different ways so that we could actually show the students and let them get in the shelters while fires were burning and understand what works, what doesn't, why it works and why it doesn't work. And those are the things I wanna kind of explain to you today and I've got a little bit of footage here and there from at least one of the shelters that I really want you to see because I've never seen this particular style shelter anywhere else. The concept comes from the super shelter, but the way we use this concept is different. And I want you to see it because it's the most unbelievably hot shelter as far as manipulating heat goes that I've ever seen that takes very little resources to make it happen. And that's really one of the keys that you have to think about in the wintertime is how much resources, including the calories in my body, including the hydration in my body, and including the wood that I'm going to have to collect, do I need to keep a fire going as well as transfer heat within my shelter and keep me at some type of a warmer temperature than the outside air that's comfortable for me. So let's first discuss a little bit about physics of fire. And then we'll discuss shelters, and then we'll put some footage in here from the weekend as well. And I want to show you this one particular shelter I'm calling the Parabolic Reflector Shelter, which I named that after a study that I read on parabolic reflectors. And I know that Morse Kahansky uses that in one of his shelters as well, the Super Shelter. And I want to explain that to you as well, because there's a lot of people out there today that build that shelter completely different than the way Morse built that shelter. And I would call them more of a modified greenhouse style shelter, not a super shelter in any way, shape or form, because you have to have that parabolic shape within the super shelter. And that's what we've tackled within this parabolic reflector shelter by means of something off the landscape as well as something that's manufactured to be used for something completely different, but works well for this. We're gonna talk about that as well. So stay with me guys. All right, so the first thing I did was I drew a terrible campfire right here for you. And the reason I did that is because what I want you to understand is there are three types of heat that come from a campfire. And that is very, very important to understand, all right? The first heat you have is you have conductive heat, all right? And I put that down here at the bottom because really the only way you're going to feel that conductive heat is by either touching something that is hot within the fire or touching the ground underneath the fire. That is conductive heat. You've got an equalization going on there on the ground of a heat sink from the ground that's trying to equalize temperature with the bottom of that fire. And that's the reason that you need to protect the bottom of the fire in wet and damp weather to kind of help battle that conduction that's robbing heat from your fire. But at the same time, after that fire has been burning for a long time, you'll get that conductive heat on the surface of the ground where that fire has been built. The second type and the most mistaken type of heat you get from a fire, as far as manipulation goes, is called convective heat, all right? And convective heat only does this. It rises straight up from the fire. If there's not a roof over that fire, you cannot trap convective heat. 
Studies show, scientific studies with quantifiable data, not I'm guessing, show that over 95% of the heat you feel from a campfire is from radiation heat, radiant heat, okay? So radiant heat is the heat that goes from the fire outward, this direction. So when you're sitting in front of a campfire, you got your hands there, you're feeling radiant heat. If you put your hands over the campfire, you'll notice that it's way hotter than it is out here, and that is convective heat. You cannot in any way, shape, or form trap that heat without something over the top of the fire that will direct that convection and not let it rise. So 95% plus of the heat that you feel on a fire is radiant heat. So the only thing you can really manipulate, because if you put a roof over the fire that's very close, obviously it's gonna burn right through it because it's too hot. So the only heat you can really manipulate from a fire is radiant heat. That's the very first thing you need to understand and the very first huge misunderstanding that people are teaching completely wrong in the survival world, okay? You cannot manipulate that convective heat. You're manipulating radiant heat, all right? Now we need to figure out how can we use that radiant heat to our advantage. So let's talk about that. Okay, let's talk about firewalls, windbreaks, fire backers, whatever you want to call them. They sure are not reflectors. I think we understand that now enough in the community. The only thing you need that for is to block wind blowing toward the fire that's going to blow across and into your shelter so that you have a cold breeze blowing into your shelter or it's blowing smoke into your shelter. Smoke will always follow the tallest object nearest the fire. So if you have a fire backer, it has to be taller than the peak of your shelter in order to take advantage of that because you are blocking the flow of air and that's what causes that smoke to come to that area. So the tallest thing is going to be where that smoke goes. So if you're going to build a fire backer, it needs to be taller than the height of your shelter to be the most effective. It does not need to be a superstructure. It does not need to be eight or 10 inch logs. What it needs to be is something that's structurally sound enough that it won't blow over in wind, which means you can probably use saplings, which are much less energy, again, that you are using to create this shelter to begin with, which means you're using less calories, okay? And you're also not cutting down giant trees for no reason. And if they're dead wood, you could be burning them. If they're live, you just cut down a live tree for no reason. That's already a semi-adult tree. So now, while we're on the subject of that, what I wanna do is I wanna show you something that you see a lot in videos. And that is that, or not in videos necessarily, but something that you see a lot in books that gets mistaken a lot. They used larger logs as firebackers for future fuel, not for any other reason. It was a dual purpose thing. What they would do is they would bank logs along poles that were driven diagonally into the ground, not straight up and down. And they would act as a windbreak here but the fire would be built directly here so that as these green logs, and they were generally green logs, dried out and began to burn, they couldn't fall forward. They could only roll into the fire eventually. So you had a self-feeding fire of sorts that had large timbers in it that would take a long time to dry out and heat up and burn so that it lasted a long time. And you would feed smaller stuff into the fire around camp as you went but this would be your, this thing's guaranteed to be going through the night. Tomorrow morning, I'll feed some more sticks. Over the course of a few days, this is going to go down and I'm going to push the ends in and all that kind of stuff. But this had nothing to do with being any kind of a way to manipulate heat. It really was a way to manipulate how much I had to feed my fire and block a little bit of wind. So if they were using larger logs in photographs, that's the reason. And it's written that way exactly in Woodcraft and Camping by Horace Kephart when he quotes what George Washington Sears says in his book. And if you read the last paragraph, it says that exactly. So 
A lot of people have seen these pictures and assumed, and it's not what it was. If you don't read the fine print, you don't understand what they were trying to accomplish. All right, now let's go back to trapping this radiant heat. First of all, what we need to understand or maneuvering this radiant heat. In order to be able to maneuver, capture this radiant heat, we have to have a reflective surface, highly reflective, like mylar, okay? Because radiant heat will bounce off of that mylar back the other direction. Now, if that mylar is in a parabolic shape, then that radiant heat, when it hits that surface, can do this kind of stuff here. It can travel up and around, all right? Because it can't go through. If you just have a tarp here, if this is just a tarp, eventually it'll hit it, it'll heat the tarp up, but it's gonna escape through that, all right? It's not gonna escape through the logs necessarily. If you have a barrier in front of your fire, like a windbreak, it's not going to escape through those logs, but what it's going to do is the logs are going to absorb it because they are an insulator. Wood is not a conductor, it's an insulator. So the heat that you feel in those logs or what you might think is transference of some kind of heat is only those logs heating up and you might be able to feel a little bit of radiant heat or seems like it's radiant heat, but it's really conductive heat if you get your hand really close to that log, okay? But I guarantee you, if you put your back to those logs and you're facing the fire, your back is still going to get cold because number one, there's nothing to direct that stuff and you're blocking the radiant heat from hitting those logs anyway, so they're not gonna get warm there. So what's behind you is gonna be cold. The only way you can change that is by directing that radiant heat with a parabolic metallic object. Hence the super shelter design, okay? Now, let's talk about super shelters real quick in this parabolic design. But before we do that, let's talk about this whole firebacker thing again. Because it's smarter money if you don't have really high winds or even if you have to build a structure and put this in front of it, the smarter money is really to use a reflective mylar type blanket on that windbreak. So if I've got a windbreak I've built right here with saplings in front of my shelter, I would put a mylar blanket right there because now I am going to reflect the radiant heat that hits this is coming back the other direction. All right. And it generally, if it's a flat surface, will bounce directly off. All right, it has to be a curved surface to direct it in any way, shape, or form so that when it hits, it kind of bounces off at an angle. Again, back to that parabolic shape. Think about those fire starters that are made out of a parabolic mirror that have something in the center to start a fire. You're directing those rays to the sun down and bouncing them up at an angle so that they all, in that parabola, get brought to that one single point. We can do the same thing in reverse, and we're gonna talk about that for heating a shelter. And that's semi where this whole super shelter thing comes from, from Morse Kahansky. But it's exactly what we're using with this parabolic reflector shelter we taught at the winter skills class this weekend. So I put mylar here because that's really gonna do something for me. If all this is doing is blocking wind, great, until the wind changes. However, I'm not saying they're a bad thing. I'm saying that take advantage of that thing and put mylar in front of that dude, and now you really got something that you can use because you're reflecting that heat back guaranteed now from the fire, all right? But even with that said, you have to remember what's called the rule of inverse squares. And what that means in simple terms is, if this is my heat source, S, okay? And I am, let's say I'm three feet or one step from that fire. And so that is 100% of the heat that I'm going to feel from that fire because I'm not getting closer. I'm at that three foot with my shelter. For every three feet I go back, I get the square root. So here, if I go six feet back, now I'm only going to get this. Okay? So even enough space between the fire reflector and where you're at, way drops that amount of heat coming back to you because you've increased this distance from three foot 
to possibly, you know, four feet, five feet, depending on how far back in your shelter your bedding system is. Just because your peak is one step from your fire doesn't mean that's where your bed's at. And that's really what you should have is that bed being one, one step away from that fire. And if you build this correctly, your fire can be small enough that even if the overhang of your shelter is fairly close to that fire, it won't make a bit of difference. And you'll see that in the video I'm going to show you from this weekend. So the rule of thumb is three foot where you're sleeping, not necessarily three foot to the peak of your shelter. So remember this rule of inverse squares when you're talking about manipulating heat as well, because it changes things a lot. Remember that we're talking about radiant heat here. The convective heat is gone. It's doing this straight up in the air. The only thing that's going this direction is radiant heat. Okay. That's what we want to manipulate. Now, if we take a parabolic shape, depending on how we do it, so let's talk about the super shelter, for instance. When he builds that super shelter, he builds a parabolic shape with saplings, vines, and weaves it together. He has a bed inside of it that takes care of his conduction because it has brows to get him off the ground. And you are going to trap heat inside here with this parabolic lens, and you have plastic wrapped around that to trap the heat so it can't escape. So you've created a greenhouse. And there are good things about that and bad things about that. The good thing about it is, if you're trapping the heat, you don't need near as much of a heat source to keep it fairly warm inside that shelter. The bad thing about it is, is because you're using a smaller fire, you're going to have to feed it more often, which means getting out of the shelter to feed the fire, coming back in. And if it's covered with plastic, that may not be the easiest thing to get in and out of. And if the fire gets built too big, and even if the fire is fairly small, this thing's going to condensate on the inside. So there's ways to manipulate that too with tarps and things like that to help absorb or direct some of that. It should, most of it, run off this direction because it's going to follow that line as it turns into a solid from a gas. But it's still going to condensate on the inside somewhat and you may get wet in there. Still, for a drop-dead emergency shelter, it's hard to beat that thing in a lot of ways. We don't have that kind of temperature here in Ohio, so I don't need to get this elaborate because I'm going to show you a shelter that has a fire in it that's less than probably four inches, five inches tall that is 110 degrees on the inside with no plastic whatsoever and two space blankets. So hang on. Okay, real quick before we move on, let's talk about one other thing. If we have our fire here, we know that the radiant heat is here and here. If our bed is up here, we're probably not getting anything here at all, almost zero, because we have to get the radiant heat direct from the fire at almost a 90 degree angle. If we have something back here like a reflector, and that's mylar, not something silver colored, something that actually reflects, then we may get some of this to heat us from underneath, and maybe some of it comes up in here and we get some here. But remember, if your body's laying here, you're blocking that radiation from hitting this as well, that reflective surface. So that's inconsequential. So you still have to have something up here that's going to make that radiant heat do this. Okay? That's what we're going to talk about with the parabolic shelter. But I want you to realize that if you choose to use a raised bed shelter, which we talked about this weekend here, you're going to need a mylar blanket to the ground because your fire is not going to be clear up level with your bed. So the radiant heat is not going there. It's going underneath. So you need to trap it from underneath with something and you can't trap it with a tarp, okay? The tarp is gonna feel warm. The tarp is going to hold some heat in before it permeates the tarp because it is a surface that won't let it go directly through it, but it will eventually go through it. It's not plastic, okay? It's not gonna hold it in there and not let it escape because it is a porous fabric of some sort, okay? Even if it's still nylon. However, what, you, what happens with this is, and I see this mistake made, and that's how I'm gonna explain it to you. If you have a tarp over a shelter and you have a raised bed in here, and you have a fire out here, and you're getting radiant heat from that fire inside your shelter, okay? 
and you say, man, this feels 20 degrees warmer than it is outside, it's 70 in here. But the fire that I have to have to do that is like this, all right? The reason for that is, is because all you're doing is this fabric is absorbing that radiant heat. Your body's absorbing the radiant heat. It's keeping it in there a little bit longer before it escapes because, again, it's permeable. So it's going to escape through it. So it feels warmer than it was. However, what you've done is you've spent a lot more firewood material to get to that point, especially if you have a raised bed and you can't capture it somehow because now you're getting a little bit, what's happening is it's going straight through here. Nothing's going here at all, nothing. If you have a tarp back here and it's not reflective, you're getting nothing this direction at all because all of the radiant heat is going this direction at a 90 degree angle. And you have to understand that to manipulate it. So your fire needs to almost be level with what you're sleeping on if you plan to have a small fire to heat a structure. Unless, again, you've got that whole plastic encompassed shelter. And then even then, the plastic is what's trapping that heat. It's going through the plastic, trapping it to the inside. And now you've got heat on the inside of that shelter. But you still have to have that radiant heat source above your bedding or at bedding level to be able to take advantage of that. Okay, now let's talk about this whole parabolic structure and where this comes from as far as at the Pathfinder School and how we used it and how we figured this out to try it to begin with. For about the last eight months, I've been working on a set of poles and the inventor of these poles is the same guy who invented the PDF deadfall, the PDF-4, the Pathfinder deadfall. And he also invented a set of poles and I've seen it called the Alpha Tent, but he is the guy. 2014 is where I saw his stuff at on Pinterest. He created a set of poles that were connected off center that turned a normal military poncho or helicon poncho or off the shelf poncho into a parabolic shape that turned it into like a dome tent. It also allowed it to be put up this direction like a half face lean and give you a parabolic shape on the backside, semi as if you pulled the hood out to make more space in there, but it's actually a structured shape. It's not just a triangle you pulled out when you pull the hood out. So what you get is you have the poncho and you have a set of poles in here that have a connector on them. And when you put them in the grommet holes, the poles are longer than the poncho. So it bells out and gives you this shape with your poles on the inside. And you'll see that on the video clip I'm gonna show you because you'll see those inside the poncho. Now, what we did was we thought, well, let's take that one step further for a winter shelter and take a Mylar blanket and put it inside here under the poncho between the poles to let the poles create that parabolic shape with a space blanket. And so now we have this parabolic shape as a shelter here and we're sleeping here and we have our fire here. And so now we have this reflective wall here. And what we did was we just put saplings in the ground and we put them in the ground kind of like this and put the space blanket like this. So it's kind of got a parabolic curvature to it too. And it's sitting right in front of the fire. So now the radiant heat from this fire is going here and reflecting back. It's going here and reflecting back. And so now you have that parabolic shape directing that radiant heat straight back down into the shelter. And you can build a fire that's almost doesn't even look like a fire. And it's 100 degrees in the shelter. So it doesn't take hardly anything to keep it warm. Now, what we did when we built this shelter to begin with, that you could probably get away with not even doing for this type of shelter because it works so well is when you build this and again this is remember this is a, this is our tarp when you build your fire in front of that you want that fire to be the length of the shelter and that's kind of what you do with a super shelter you build a long fire in front of it and that feeds the entire shelter that way with this type of shelter you probably don't need a fire that's the whole length because no matter if that fire is sitting let me get my bearing straight again here if my fire is sitting right here and the radiant heat's going here and here and here, if that fire is only this big, 
when it hits these surfaces that are curved, they're going to be directed at angles and manipulated anyway. So you may not have to go the full length of this with the fire. You may just be able to be right here, like in one third of it in the middle, which is an even smaller fire with even less wood. And instead of being 110 degrees in there, it's 70. I can tell you now that if you watch someone in front of a fire that's supposed to be trapping or manipulating heat and they're fully clothed in winter clothing while they're doing it, they're not, that fire's doing nothing for them, okay? Because I can tell you right here yesterday that you wouldn't want to stand between that space blanket and that shelter for more than a minute or two without shedding clothing because it was 110 degrees Fahrenheit inside this shelter. So even out here, it was probably in the 80s and you're wearing full winter clothes. So if I make this a smaller fire, bring us down to that 70 degree mark, I'm in there in my base layers or less sleeping and I've got it made. All now I have to do is worry about battling conduction from the ground with some type of browse bed or mattress. But the only thing I had to carry to create this shelter was a poncho, a set of poles that are this big around and this long when they're folded up that are made from arrow shaft aluminum that have collars on them for the poncho and a connector in the middle to let them swing. Literally, literally ounces of weight. A military poncho or a helicon poncho, two space blankets, and really this one inside here could be one of them, could be this, could be that right there. It could be one of those origami space blankets you're only gonna use at one time and ditch it. That could be the one you use inside here. And now you're just carrying this and your normal reusable space blanket is the one you put here on the front as your reflector. So you're still carrying one space blanket. You're carrying a poncho. You throw this in your bag. You got a way to make fire. You got something to make a browse bed with. You're carrying a mattress. But if you're carrying trash bags, you can make a browse bed. You got it made. We had guys sleep like babies in this shelter last night that they made for themselves out toward the wildlife area on school property at 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to try to show you guys was a modified style super shelter. And again, modified super shelter. It's not parabolic in any way, shape, or form. So there's no sense insulting Morskahansky by calling it something it's not. This is just a greenhouse style shelter that's been modified using a reusable space blanket and a painter's tarp to trap the heat inside to keep it warmer. But again, you've got to get in and out of this thing to feed whatever fire you have in front of it throughout the night. That can be a pain in the butt. All right, so this shelter, you can see there's four stakes in the ground with a Mylar space blanket. You can see that the Mylar space blanket is much higher than the peak of that shelter. So all the smoke is coming here and all the radiant heat is being reflected. And it's in a parabolic shape somewhat, so that it is reflecting it at angles back toward the shelter, all right? We don't have any leaves in these bags right now, so we're not battling conduction at this point. I'm not trying to fool anybody there. You need four inches of compressed insulation in here to battle conduction. The shelter is the important part. We have one ridge line that goes across here that this shelter is connected to. And if you lift this up, you can see those poles inside that are connected to the corners. And they create a parabolic shape inside here with the mylar. And now what you have is you have this belled out parabolic curve that when that radiant heat comes in here, gets reflected right back down into the shelter. And it does not take a large fire to do that. You can see, this is where we had the fire built yesterday. There's not hardly anything there. All right, it took a fire that was about four inches high and five feet long to make it 110 degrees inside that shelter. All right, so we looked at that shelter real quick and I'm gonna show you some actual footage from the class toward the end of this video. But what I wanna explain between those two shelters is, and both of those, what I would call best options, period, for down and dirty. Piece of plastic, space blanket, two space blankets, and your poles for your poncho. Very simple stuff, very lightweight, very easy to carry. And you wouldn't have to necessarily use those poles because you could use green saplings to accomplish the same exact thing with a poncho. You just might have to do some measuring and cutting to get it right. 
but you could do it very, very easily. Not like you have to buy something to make that happen. I've been working on this for something else for a poncho tent type deal. But now that I figured this out, it's just a multifunctional item. And again, they're coming out here, I think next week, but I'm gonna put a specific video about those. I'm just showing you them today to show you where this whole idea originated for this parabolic reflector shelter after I did some research on how heat is actually manipulated and radiant heat is manipulated with mylar and reflective objects. So anyway, that being said, those are the two shelters I would recommend for a really, really cold weather environment if you're trying to carry minimal amount of emergency survival type gear. You can do that with regular farm I wouldn't do it with paracord, but if you're a thicker diameter road, whether you use Okay, listen guys, I didn't want to get this video too convoluted with other information from the Winter Skills class, but there's a lot of really good information that could be put into a series of videos about Eastern Woodland winter survival and what to pack and carry and things like that. But I'll save that for a later date. I appreciate your views. I appreciate your support. I thank you for everything you do for our school, for our family, for our business, all our sponsors, instructors, affiliates, and friends. And I'll be back with another video as soon as I can, guys. Thanks.